Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be the relief pitcher tonight. So without further ado, our starting pitcher and ace uh, um, chief data officer, a position that was newly created at this office, I give you Rob Ross. Hi, everyone. Good evening. So in the last couple of years, the Cook County Assessor's Office has not fared particularly well in the press. Uh, we haven't had the most favorable headlines. And a large part of the criticism uh, was founded, was, was based on the idea that, that our office was not transparent. Um, and in particular, we were not particularly clear about the code and the algorithms that we used to value residential property. Um, in a world where policy is increasingly dependent upon computer algorithms, I mean, you have facial recognition technology, you have in our office computer algorithms that are valuing more than a million residential parcels every three years, and every year hundreds of thousands of residential parcels. Um, code really is a sign of policy, right? The code is, in some ways, the policy because the code does the heavy lifting and incorporates all of the decisions that the policy makes. This is an argument that we made to a hiring monitor for our office um, that the senior data scientist roles were policy making roles. They're not simply engineers. They're not simply mechanics. Um, a policymaker doesn't go to a, a senior data scientist and says, I want you to fix this, and the mechanic just fixes it. No, the senior data scientist takes an active role in making uh, decisions, right? Because code is what? Code is a, is a series of, it's a function of choices, functions of meaningful choices, sometimes arbitrary choices, and obviously mathematical constraints, right? Choices like what data to include, exclude, choices about what structure to estimate or what estimation procedures to use and things like that. Obviously, there are constraints in the real world, degrees of freedom, right? Collinearity, simple processing time. If you write a beautiful function that takes five days to estimate, it's not particularly helpful. Right? And these, these need to be conveyed to the policymakers. Um, and, and sometimes we don't know the difference between an arbitrary choice or a meaningful choice. Sometimes things seem arbitrary, but they actually turn out to be really important. So code publication is necessary for meaningful transparency because the code is the policy. Uh, and this is particularly true for agencies like ours that leverage code to make a big difference in people's lives. So I'm going to pivot for a second away from transparency, and we're going to tell you about what we did in our first 100 days. Uh, we, uh, Fritz assumed office on December 3rd. We had virtually no transition or assistance from the prior administration. So imagine inheriting an office with the complexity of ours, cold turkey. Um, we had Norwood Park assessments were due February 8th, which gave us 67 calendar days to A, replicate the residential assessment system, and B, make improvements where we could. So we also had some additional barriers. We had all of our data stored in this non-ODBC capable AS400, so it's really hard to get data out of it and to select the data that we want. All of our legacy scripts were saved individually as text files, which makes it really hard to figure out what's going on, what's changed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, not a whole lot of comments. Hashtag no comments, sad face. <laughs> <laughs> got to comment. You got to comment your code, people. A uh, lot of processes that span multiple technological platforms. So the data is queried by COBOL, and then it is processed in SPSS, and then it is sometimes changed in Excel, and then uploaded back into a COBOL-based system. Lots of, pro lots of processes also incorporate these manual sort of, then I just look over the values to see if anything stands out. And if they look weird, I change them. OK. How do I report what you've changed? How do I justify what you've changed? So what do we do? First, we establish a SQL server that's going to be the mirror of the older system so that we can actually access our data and manipulate it. We conducted an end-to-end -end audit of the legacy residential valuation process. And we re replicated from end-to-end -end every single step in R, from the query that constructs the data, the, all the SPSS scripts that estimate uh, residential values. We also reconstructed the condominiums process in R. Uh, we, we, we took, we talk, by talking to the analysts, we replicated what they were doing manually in R uh, to the best of our ability. Um, and we also created reporting mechanisms to take the data back out and say, OK, how did this go? <laughs> and obviously, as we worked, if we saw something that seemed not great, we made it less not great. So 
I'm, not, I'm gonna go through some systems diagrams. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them because you'll have the slides, you can study them in depth later. But this is the legacy system. We created a mirror using modern, more modern technology and we ran both systems in parallel for every single township so that we said, listen, we're not just replacing it and hoping that we're better. We are going to demonstrate with every township that the new system performs, outperforms, or at least performs as well as the legacy system. Again, not gonna spend a lot of time on the, <laughs> but I do wanna talk about something that's been in the press a lot, which is the model, okay? What, show us the model, what is the model? Well, there no longer is the model. There are lots of models. What we have built is what I will call a model agnostic rudimentary machine learning process. So I'll just really keep it really simple. Um, basically, the idea here is that we have, we develop a list of high quality models, models that we think are not crazy. And then we go through that list and estimate every single one of those models. Every time we estimate it, we estimate it on variations of the underlying data. So we'll estimate the model, we'll pitch out some outliers, we re-estimate it. We do this 500 times. And then with, with each iteration, we subject it to a battery of performance statistics that are already defined by the International Association of Assessing Officers. So these are the standardized performance statistics that every office has to judge itself by. And at the end of the whole process, we've got, you know, 700 to 1,000 different iterations, and we pick the one that performs the best. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about a culture of transparency because it's not one way. It's not that the government is transparent and then the public doesn't have to do anything. The, the public has to be participation. If elected officials take risks in being transparent, right? What if, what if we make a mistake and we don't catch the mistake and you catch the mistake and then you send me a nasty pull request? Um, like, you idiot, why would you do that? What if, what if people take our work and intentionally misconstrue it? Right? They act in bad faith. Or what if people, what if we reveal a problem about another agency? We're doing a great job, but those guys over there are doing a terrible job. Uh, or what if we reveal negative facts about taxpayers, right? Like what if we find that an entire town is engaged in sort of, like we find the Cayman Islands of Cook County. <laughs> Like that would, be, that would be bad because you don't want to call out taxpayers and be like, you guys are bad, right? Uh, and what, what if we confuse the public with too much detail, right? Like we lose their confidence because we start talking about AI and they've seen that movie and it wasn't very good. <laughs> and they're like, what are you talking about? You're letting a computer decide these things? So if an elected, I just want to, if an elected official is punished for pursuing transparency, other elected officials, they're not going to be interested. But on the other hand, if, if we have a culture of transparency, right? If we promote a constructive and respectful dialogue, then other agencies will follow suit, right? So, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what works and what doesn't. You know, that, that, that lengthy, like, be nice to me, <laughs> I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about what works with our code and, and what doesn't work as well. I mean, it works, but it could be better. Um, so the new valuation system, it's faster, it's more accurate, and more, more transparent, right? Everything's done in R. The data moves seamlessly from the system of record into the system, it's processed, and it comes back out. It takes like 20 minutes to run the whole thing for one township. Um, for most of the townships, we're producing values that are within the standards, right? We're meeting the, the standard for high quality assessments. But for some townships, we're not. And as you all know, modeling can only take you so far. Right, the smartest, most sophisticated, like whatever, Watson, okay? If you're like, Watson, here's a $1 bill, can you predict the probability that I have cancer? Watson is not gonna be able to do that. So <laughs> you need to have high quality data going into the system in order to get high quality res results to come out of the system. Um, and the simple fact is that our underlying data, it faces, it, it has some limitations, particularly in areas where uh, the housing stock is very heterogeneous, right? So in Norwood Park, you go down a block and all the houses almost sometimes look completely identical. You go to New Trier and you're like, okay, 20 million, 5 million, 800,000, 35 million. That's, that's really hard to model if you don't have granular individual level data that it allows us to distinguish a $30 million house from a $20 million house. Um, it's not the number of bathrooms is the answer. It's more than just the number of bathrooms. In fact, at some point you have too many bathrooms. So to give you an example, here's Norwood Park. 
The key to look at here is the spread. These are the, quart these are the interquartile range. Orange is the 75th percentile, blue is the 25th percentile, and the green is the median. When you compare it to Nutrier, if you look at the scales, right, like Norwood Park, the spread of values is like really, really tiny compared to Nutrier, right? So like, uh, you know, the poorest, the, the, the cheapest house in Nutrier is, would be the most expensive house in, in, in Norwood Park. And the most expensive house in Nutrier is worth like half of the aggregate housing value of Norwood Park, right? This makes it extremely important to have granular, individual high quality data on individual properties because your you know your neighborhood fixed effects are just not going to cut it so what do we see so the cod is a measure of dispersion it's a coefficient of dispersion it tells us how dissimilar properties of a of the same sale price are right so two houses they sell for 100,000 if what we assess one at 95 and the other at 105 we've achieved a cod of 10 okay so in Norwood Park, we meet the standard, okay? Anything below 15, the IAAS says you're a okay. So obviously our point estimate and our confidence intervals are well within the 15, the gray area, that's the end zone. Nutrier, not so much. Again, if you look at the scales, uh, the, the, the Nutrier assessments are, the CODs are too high, um, and the confidence intervals for 2018 are, are nuts, right? Oh. So the, 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 the message here, right, is like, where, does, where, do, we, where do we not, where, where, what are we struggling with? The answer, we're struggling with data. We need high quality data that is complete and that is robust, right? I want to know whether you have a pot filler in your kitchen. I would love to know that. I, I feel like a pot filler is a great proxy for housing value. If I could see, if you, have a, if you have a pot filler in your kitchen, I know two things. One, you've probably never used it. <laughs> and two, you have a really nice kitchen, okay? So, to, to speak about data quality, uh, uh, my, my boss, Fritz Kegi, is going to come up here and talk about data. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of weight falling on that man's shoulders, so we take good care of him here at the assessor's office. Uh, so we think, you know, when you think about reforming an office like the assessor's office, we have uh, really good human capital in place. We actually have a lot of folks who've invested a lot in their skills. And we can bring in a lot of the data modeling techniques that have been achieved in all the, all the different ways that Rob can bring things in. When folks like you can come in, we can bring in the adopted knowledge that we have about uh, what assessor's offices can do to model better. We can talk about other, uh, what other assessor's offices are doing in the rest of the US too. But the data is the harder problem, just like Rob said. So on the residential side, you can imagine, how do we get those attributes about residential properties that can help us be more accurate in a place like Nutrier, but in, in other places? And it's all, uh, there are many things that we can do to think, have good data. So at the end, we'll, we'll, we're going to seek your help on how, what we can do to improve our residential data. There's outside databases that we can use. We can incorporate technology by uh, bringing in oblique photography and imagery, the kinds of things that are used in Street View that can actually get distances to a good dimension. There are other ways we can improve our residential side. And the model that we're going to be releasing tonight is our residential model. Um, if you think we've got issues on the residential side, um, we have even more issues on the commercial side. Because with commercial properties, we have fewer properties, we have fewer sales. So the on the residential side, we can use regression analysis, and we have some attributes that are pretty good that get us most of the way there in most cases. But on the commercial side, it's so very diverse. Think of all the car washes, small stores, office buildings, um, in incredible variety that, that we have in the economy here in Chicago. And we don't have many sales taking place. Now, what we do know is that commercial properties are basically valued based on the income that they earn. The problem that we have is that we cannot require building owners, like the owner of, uh, of Merchandise Mart and all the other properties that you can think of, to give us their rent and income and expense data. We have to estimate it. So imagine how hard it is to estimate the net operating income of a building like the Merchandise Mart. We, our analysts have to go out and figure, OK, what's the average rent per square foot here? Then you have to figure out how much it costs to operate a building like the Merchandise Mart. Then they have to figure out what's the occupancy rate at the Merchandise Mart. 
and then they have to figure out what is the multiple of operating income that the market would pay. So all of these things, they are observable. There are third-party databases that can have some of this, but when you roll it all together, that can lead to great inaccuracy. That's the problem that we struggle with. Fortunately, we've talked to a lot of assessors' offices around the country, and if you think we're trying to do good things, we, you know, we, we think our, the assessor in New York is one of our heroes. She's a PhD of, uh, in econometrics from Yale and has done great things. And there are lots of other states that have a framework where we can require larger commercial properties to submit basic rent and expense information to us at the outset of the assessment process. People already submit this data when they appeal, when they appeal to us or to the Board of Review, but we want to collect the data at the outset so we can be really accurate in our assessments and make the system predictable. Right now, lots of value is destroyed in our economy and here in, in the Chicago area because people, there's a lot of uncertainty generated by our, our assessments. When, when our analysts are trying to go out and get this data, the data be, can, can be kind of dirty. Maybe it might even be easier for the merchandise mart, but because there's third-party data on big buildings like this, but imagine trying to estimate uh, that kind of data for a single uh, for a, a, a single story storefront store in Chatham, where there's not much data about occupancy, rents, uh, expenses. Imagine you're tr we're trying to estimate the the, co um, the net operating income of an older building in near north that kind of has an unusual footprint, uh, doesn't have AC. Um, what does a building like that rent out for? How much does it cost to run it? If we can require people to submit this information at the start, we can do a better job of assessing it. So that's what SB 1379 is. What we'll do is we'll collect this information um, on a bulk and anonymized basis. So folks will, about 50,000 properties in Cook County will submit the data um, to us each year. Um, and then we'll take that data and for like buildings, we will then publish data on those like buildings. What the, so imagine, for example, Class B office space downtown will get um, average rent, average occupancy, average cost to operate, and um, the cap rate that the market seems to be paying for properties like this. And then we can assess them accuracy, accurately and also provide predictability to the system because we're publishing our models now, but it's hard to know for people in the market what data goes into the models. But when we have the bill in place, we can collect that data and publish it each year. So folks in Chicago, when we get around to reassessing it in 2021, know where we'll be going. And then they can uh, borrow money, they can make transactions, they can plan, they can tell their lessees. We suffer a lot of value that's destroyed from hedging behavior, from all the uncertainty that's created. We can eliminate that uncertainty. So this bill has passed the Senate in the 3616, uh, that says 366, but 3616, bipartisan supermajority vote. It's now before the House, and we think it's going to be a really great story to see how it proceeds uh, in the House uh, tw uh, uh, before this session ends. Um, and we encourage your support in that and encourage you to use the data that we'll be publishing because we will have great neighborhood by neighborhood data on rents, occupancy, uh, uh, expenses. We'll have a sense for what it costs to operate a 100-year-old building versus the average across the city, and this can provide all sorts of really interesting data that we might not know the use of, but I bet you could find really great uses for it in your work, and that will be a, a big outcome of the data bill. Um, we are now at the point where we are going to, uh, we've helped, we've not published the code yet here tonight. Um, what I'd like to do here first is salute the combination of youthful exuberance, interesting hair, and the sense of promotion that we have in this room tonight. If you all look under your chairs, there is one person who will recognize the picture under the chair here tonight. Everyone look look under your chair. chair. So, Bill Vec, so, okay, so what I was gonna try to show you with the picture that I had was it's, that- It's over here somewhere. Is that I was a, I was a White Sox fan you when I was a kid. Give it to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> I was a White Sox fan when I was a kid. And uh, uh, the, the owner at the time was a guy named Bill Vec, who was a great promoter. He's the guy who planted the ivy. Come, come, uh, come on. <laughs> All right. If you can show, the, if, if there's a way to put the picture up there so people can see it. Oh, I didn't know this. Uh, we had it. Okay. Uh. All right. That's me. 
There is one person in here in the back there, Jonathan Levy, who'd recognize that picture because we grew up playing baseball together. <laughs> yeah, can you full screen? Um, okay, so, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so, um, uh, Bill Fack, to get people in the ballpark, put... Uh, uh, special promotions under the seats so people would hurry to get to the ballpark and find the case of sausages or whatever was under the seat and so that's how we get the idea of putting the picture under there so you found the lucky picture of me with my um, uh, mother provided haircut <laughs> there um, and uh, you get the honors of pressing go on releasing the code It's okay. Anyone who wants to take a gander at this mother-provided haircut, go oh, and yeah. take a glance. <laughs> All right. As Rob was mentioning, we, you know, the code that we have uh, is not perfect because we're tr we are confronting um, we are confronting uh, the you know when I go out into the community and I talk about what we're doing, about what we've done in the last hundred days, um, we um, you know we we have a lot of things that we're proud of, but. For every situation where we're proud, we're still not getting it right. And people bring me situations like when we were up in New Trier for, you said my home was worth this amount of money and I would gladly take anyone's offer for this amount of money that you just valued my property at. And sometimes it's, we're clearly not getting it right. And so what we've been saying is, this is a case for Shy Hack Night uh, where we can go and try to find out how we can attack some of these problems. And so this is how we'd like to get your help um, in helping us to improve the code. So we've released the code for everyone to see, and we'll be following up with um, cases where we think the, the model is not working, and we'd love to get you guys involved with some of the things we're working on. So this is a great way to continue. We'd also like you to file a witness slip for our bill, uh, SB 1379. You can read about it more online. The support of this community here will help us make the commercial assessment system work as well as the work that Rob is doing uh, on the residential side that we've shown you here today. Um, we'd like you to, to, uh, to tweet at us as you're coming up with um, issues when you're looking through the code, say, hey, I noticed this, why is this happening? Or tell me more about why you're doing this. Um, that'll help to spread the word about the availability of this data and also help us to get better solutions to uh, the problems that we're encountering. You, you are our best ambassadors here for what we're doing. We know we're uh, confronting quite a legacy of non-transparency and we have to earn people's trust. And part of that is interacting with you, taking your constructive feedback and showing that there's a, a different day in this office and that we can go from being a laggard to a leader on transparency and accuracy. So we love the questions. And again, be a collaborator with us. Um, we, we'd love you to help uh, build improvements to the code. You know, We've written it in R so you can uh, you can, first of all, you can replicate our results, see how that's going. We've also released all our assessor data and the data dictionaries. Um, so thank you, Rob, for doing that. Uh, but there are other things, too, and we'd love to get you involved in collaborating. So again, send us examples of also public entities that have done this best in class as examples of, as you're finding them. Uh, we, we're going to create a working group, and we'd love to have uh, come back to a future Shy Hack Night to show what our working groups have done on attacking some of these problems and demonstrate progress. So with that, thank you, everyone, and uh, let's go right into Q&A. Um, will you be able to um, estimate changes on taxes based on like construction projects or um, improvements done to neighborhoods with this data um, model? In, indirectly, yes. So one of the most important things to know about our assessment system here in Illinois is it's different from many states. In many states, they have something called a millage rate, which is where if you know your assessment and then the loca locality publishes a rate or you know, passes a rate that is the taxation rate on that assessment, then you're good to go. You don't have to worry about what's going on in the rest of the system and you're off to the races. We do not have that system here in Illinois. In Illinois, uh, we back into our rates. 
So we, have, we start with taxing bodies like the city and the C CPS and many other uh, entities. They pass a levy, which is a lump sum of dollars that adds up to about $14 billion in Cook County every year. And then that levy is divided up amongst us based on each property's proportional share of the total assessed value in, that, in the whole community. So um, that's supposed to be made based on market prices. We think we're getting closer to that. And then so for new properties, we can give you really good accuracy on what your assessment would look like for a new property. Like we're gonna be able to be uh, really uh, accurate on what that, you, you'll have really good line of sight on what new construction could be assessed at, especially if we have the data bill and you're building commercial properties. But the thing that's missed, you're still missing two important pieces from that equation. You don't know how the whole uh, area that you're in will be assessed. So imagine you're building a building in Lincoln Park. You need to also care about how are we assessing storage units on the south side, uh, small affordable housing units elsewhere, and then uh, big office buildings downtown and uh, uh, big multifamily units on the, on the coast. So you need to know all of those things. So we're gonna try to give you more transparency to that. That is a harder piece because we have TIFs that create a feedback loop which can be difficult to analyze. But we're trying to be as accurate as we can and at least giving you clarity on what your assessment would be. There is a question from the document uh, that I think will be easily answered quickly. Uh, the question is, where's the link to the code? Uh-huh. It's in the slides. It's in the notes on the slide. You could probably find it by Googling like CCAO Data Modeling Group GitLab. We can also put a link to the code in this document after the presentation is over, and we'll, we can tweet it or something. How far are you along with the, um, the fair tax rate in, in the southern suburbs versus, you mentioned Nutria earlier, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering how far are you along with uh, in terms of code and getting uh, fair tax rates in the southern suburbs. And another question is, do you have any sort of control over these TIF funds, or is it something that you can do from your department, <coughs> excuse me, that you can do something about these TIFs? Because, you know, because an area like North Lawndale, I heard, in the 24th Ward, that's one of the poorest areas in the city. Yes. They're taking money out of TIF money that's supposed to go back into the ward from taxpayers to build up the ward. They taking money out of the uh, 24th ward and putting it into uh, th this project over the uh, Lincoln Yards in the 78. And I'm just wondering, is there anything that you can do regarding that, for lack of better words? I'm sorry. It, Okay, thank you. There are a number of questions in there. First of all, on TIFs, we don't control the TIFs funds. What we do is we value all properties in the county, um, and then from that, through our uh, assessments on each property, then we uh, divide up each person's share of each property's uh, share of the levy, and then that becomes each uh, um, property owner's share of the, of, you know, each property owner's share of total assessed value becomes their share of the levy. It's complicated when they're in a TIF because the f amount after we're done, the amount that they're paying is diverted into two different streams. There's the stream that goes to the, the taxing bodies, and that is frozen. Okay. And the incremental stream goes to the TIF. So it goes into a side pocket, and that's what makes it hard for us to estimate when assessments are being changed, how much is being diverted from uh, the taxing bodies into a TIF, and then what is necessary for uh, 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 all those properties that are not in a TIF to get to the levy, to get to the point that the levy is being paid, and then what tax rate does that translate into those? While they're on the TIF, you have any, say our assessments go up in an area where there's TIF, that means the incremental levy is going into the TIF. It's not going to the taxing bodies. So that creates a complex feedback loop and that sort of increases the gravity of the decision making about how that TIF money is spent. In the city of Chicago, that's basically the mayor's office, although in consultation with the local alderman. But this you know, raises you know, a couple of interesting questions about transparency and democracy 
when the important fiscal function of the city council um, is is yielded um, to the decision making of the mayor's office. So that's that is something very important. But we cannot assess properties differently on whether they're in a TIF or not. We just care about the market value of those properties, um, and that's our job. Um, so. Uh, but then you asked about the southern suburbs. So when, in Cook County, we assess one third of the county every year. So right now we're doing the northern suburbs and we have, uh, you know, Rob has explained some of the problems that we've confronted already. And then we have a variety of other problems in the remaining townships that we'll address there. And then we go to the southern suburbs, which have a different group of problems. One of the most important uh, things going on in the south suburbs is that it has never, housing prices have never recovered from the financial crisis. Um, so we have lots of situations where we have underwater mortgages, we have lots of problems with vacancy, we have a dearth of data, um, and we have high effective tax rates that have a complex feedback loop with the prices that people are willing to pay. So these are very, they're, they're different analytical problems. We are going to get to them next year. What I can say is going back to the data modernization bill, that is why the timing is urgent uh, for passage of the bill this year, because then we can start collecting data in the second half of the year that we can use in assessing the southern suburbs. This is very important because, for say we have a shopping mall and we're trying to assess it, uh, we need to know about what's the leasing rates that we could get in the shopping mall today, what's the average occupancy, uh, what's the cap rate that people are willing to pay, and what's the expense of operating these things. All these things are really hard to do with the data that's available, and we'll be in a much better position to do that uh, if we have the data modernization bill because we can know what, hey, a new lease is being signed at this mall at this level which is well below what averages were in the past. Right now, when we use the data for commercial properties, we look through the rear view mirror, and that's probably gonna be very wrong for a place like the south suburbs. So we need current live data to do a good job on assessing things like retail properties and malls in the south suburbs. So just to quickly answer your question, we have not gotten to it yet, but we know that the data modernization bill is very important for the south suburbs. That's why Will Davis is sponsoring it in the House, Toy Hutchinson sponsored it in the Senate. They both represent the south suburbs. Uh, uh, Rob, any additional modeling comments on the south suburbs? All right, very good. We'll get to the next question. I'm long-winded sometimes, so. Thank you so much for your presentation, for coming down here and talking more about your work and all the, you know, the great, you know, great job that you're doing at the moment. And I, I wanted, to t wanted to ask you about the state of modernization bill and how confident you feel about it passing. Mm -hmm. And if in the unfortunate event that it doesn't, what are the next steps that you foresee taking in order to amend you know, the issues that you're, you're trying to address? Well, we, we have uh, every reason to be optimistic about passage in the House, and I'll give you a couple of reasons why. The bill, uh, first of all, it passed by a bipartisan supermajority in the Senate. This is a front burner issue for many people. It's getting lots of attention. And in the House, we have uh, members of House leadership who are chief sponsors on the bill. So the chairman of the Revenue Committee is a chief co-sponsor on the bill. Will Davis, who's an assistant majority leader, is the lead sponsor. Other assistant majority leaders like Kelly Burke and uh, Fred Crespo are on the bill. Uh, every conversation that we've had with the, the, the leadership of the House, the conversations have been very constructive. And we've had a good long period of time to work with stakeholders on getting the wording right, making technical fixes, amending it. It's been a many months long process and so we feel good about that. And we have a wonderful group, a diverse group of supporters from people in the retail community. For example, Brookfield, which is the biggest mall owner in the world. They own Water Tower Place, the International Council of Shopping Centers, which owns 4,500 uh, shopping centers in Illinois alone. Uh, its members have supported the bill, uh, BMO Harris Bank, but then also trade unions, affordable housing groups like the Community Investment Corporation, um, uh, the Illinois Assessors Association, uh, incoming Mayor Lori Lightfoot, uh, a unanimous resolution of the county board. So we've got really good support and momentum. The test will be, do we get our votes? And we, we have every reason to believe that we expect to, that we will get that. If we don't, well, I'm very superstitious, so let's just go one step at a time. 
Um, and I don't want to commit the act of hubris. So we have to prove ourselves for sure uh, in the house like, and get the job done ourselves. So, But your, your support, uh, talk, tweeting about it, telling people about it, slipping for it, means a lot. Your representatives look to you, especially as folks in the tech community, for why this is important, why good data makes for better assessments, um, more fairness, better process, and helps to facilitate investment. These are all key things to, to get across. Yes? I'm going to take a question from the document. Uh, what can we still learn from the assessment approaches from other municipalities? Great question. Um, because we, we had a nice long transition period when we came into this office. You know, we won the primary in March of, of uh, 2018. We had nearly a year uh, uh, before we came in. We came in in December. Uh, we were able to go to the annual conference of the International Association of Assessing Officers. They are great at parties. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, like, it's, like, it's like this place. It's like geek heaven um, there. It's people who get really excited about valuation. If you say, hey, I've got a whole new approach to valuing cell towers, you can fill a whole room of people like this. Like, there is a world out there. So uh, we met uh, assessors from, I think, the 20 biggest jurisdictions in the United States, and there are great best practices from each of them. So I mentioned Carmela Quintos in New York, the assessor. She uh, is our hero when it comes to commercial data collection and modeling. Um, and they are able to assess the whole city of New York every year with incredible precision, coming from a level of imprecision where we are now to now where they're very precise. And they do it the whole, the whole uh, city of New York every year with great precision using these techniques. And New York is a pretty darn good real estate market. Um, so, and, and this is all about good modeling. This is where good modeling um, help to supplement sort of old school appraisers they brought in, uh, uh, folks from the East Coast equivalent of uh, uh, the Harris School and UIC and, and also startups, um, people familiar in programming in R uh, to make a big difference and that's really worked well together. When we look to the King County Assessor, uh, which is the Seattle area, we see a great assessor's office at data transparency. Um, and, and being user friendly. So on there, if you go to their site, you can draw a square on a map of any place in King County and get the economic attributes of that area. Rents, occupancy, uh, average sale prices, other bits of economic data. And it's really user friendly if you're thinking about investing or moving there. Um, and we wanna have that same, we wanna um, improve upon that uh, by having it be very user friendly compared to our current website. Um, we look at, <laughs> all right, there we go, um, Maricopa County, which is also a county about the qu equivalent in size and parcel count to ours is the Phoenix area. Um, they are really good at using, doing field work. So they've used the technology to get really good information about homes um, and be really precise about it. And so they use oblique imagery and LIDAR to get the external attributes of buildings right, measurements right, see swimming pools through satellite imagery, things like that. And so we can, they can find uh, buildings that didn't have building permits. And that's the kind of thing that we have to work on. We know it's going to be a multi-year process, and we can learn a lot from them. We talked to other real estate investors and said, uh, what's the best place to invest in terms of predictability and transparency and helping you figure out what the assessment piece will be so you can invest? We heard Virginia, we heard Massachusetts. These are states that have uh, uh, data f submission frameworks like, they, like we would have in the data modernization bill. So v areas with very healthy real estate markets, um, those are blue states, but also red states, Tennessee and Georgia that have that same framework in place. So we can learn from a lot of these places and uh, all of them have been terrifically helpful and they know that we have quite a legacy to go up against. We have. You know, all the data that's trapped in paper, we have a mainframe, we have all these other problems with uh, poor data, but um, they've all given us great assistance and uh, we've, we're already, all of us here in Cook County are realizing some of the benefits of that already. Yes. Um, so thank you guys for coming out. I really appreciate that um, opportunity for you guys to show kind of how you tackled the very nasty um, problem. Um, so essentially, um, I wanted to kind of have a conversation about, um, so the model it seems like, 
um, I would be able to put certain inputs and then provide me a score about like the assessments of that particular house, so to say. And in some cases, I could turn it into a predictive model. I could predict like if I do like decide to invest in this particular area given these certain inputs, it has a score. And so one of the biases that come from modeling is that it has this implicit idea of like, um, sort of say like you're investing in a community sort of say, um, but the results of like having those particular investments by like, um, let's say like Logan Square, which is like being gentrified as we speak and like yes. Wilson sort of that. So this model is kind of like showing people sort of say implicitly that we should be sort of say divesting from South Side, you know, like neighborhoods and be investing in areas that are sort of say potentially like have more um, money sort of say. So the first part is kind of like, you know, how do you juggle that? How do you keep that in mind? Because the model is, um, there's something about like what the model says, and then there's also kind of the interpretation of the models going on. The second piece is time series. Like, how are you taking care of like 2014, 2015, 16, 17? Like, you have to part, you have to have that part of your model because I don't know. You talked about it like once, but I was like, you need to consider time part of your model. Okay, yeah. great, thanks. So I'm going to leave that second part for Rob. <laughs> um, what what I'd say is that uh, the I think the original sin of our office is. Um, not letting the data, basically not letting market prices determine our, determine our assessments and instead injecting, becoming a law unto our own selves in the office and diverting it in a direction that we think might be beneficial. Because remembering how our assessment system works, if we help one group uh, in, dis in, in, in moving the data, in moving our assessments in one direction because it's based on our personal preferences, rather than what market prices are, everyone else has to make up the difference. If I decide to assess something differently from market prices, um, uh, then everyone else has to make up the difference for that. Say, say I might think that office buildings uh, downtown Chicago are really desirable, and so I'm not gonna use the, uh, the market prices of them. Um, that means everyone else in the rest of Chicago has to pay. Actually, we think that um, right now, a lot of investment doesn't take place on the south side because the margin of safety is so small for success, between success and failure, and that assessment volatility, the uncertainty of our assessments, is literally making the difference between someone investing and someone not. Um, right now, we don't have good data about occupancy in, in neighborhoods, and we can really be getting, getting it very far off on what the average rent is for a building with uh, that's over 100 years old, that has a strange floor plate, that doesn't have AC, all these things we, we can't really find well in third-party data, and we could be uh, making quite an error with them. And then if you're a bank, or you're a buyer or investor, and you, don't know, you, can't, you can't feel good about where the assessment's gonna be, then you need to have a margin of safety to invest, and the margin of safety can be so big that you don't make the investment. And we think that is happening in a lot of neighborhoods where there's not enough uh, data, and our assessments have been so uncertain that, that people, there's basically de facto redlining. So what we wanna do is make it predictable, to say, if, uh, if you're gonna invest in Chatham, here's what we know about actual rents that are paid for single-story retail in Chatham. Here's the average occupancy. Here's what it costs to operate this kind of building versus an average building. And here's the multiple of operating income that a person will pay today in Chatham to buy a property. So we're not mixing it in with more expensive areas um, uh, on the north side, for example. That's really important. That can help to preserve and help people invest in small scale businesses that they're, they're getting an appropriate assessment for that kind of neighborhood, for that kind of building. Similarly, say, uh, you know, there's affordable, there's a, there's a uh, you know, multi-unit building, like a 10 flat in a courtyard building in Logan Square that's, that's uh, different from a newer building built uh, on the north side that's like a 100 unit building that's contemporary, that's institutionally owned. We have good data on institutional multifamily properties, and that's, when we're doing our modeling, we think that uh, right now, the data that we have kind of skews to higher value, more institutional, uh, lower cost to operate, 
more premium that people are willing to pay for in the market, like that data is out there. If we're scraping SEC filings to get appraisals, what's the kind of properties that are included in SEC filings? It's higher end properties. So having the bill is really important to getting things right for, for smaller uh, buildings that are higher cost, that might have lower rent, that have harder to collect rent. We can assess them more appropriately if we have the data to put them in, and then we can provide predictability to the market because we're publish our, publishing our models tonight. We publish how we do our commercial assessments. Right now, without the bill, no one has the idea what data will go into our models in the future. With the bill, we can provide people with that. And so that's how we think we help affordable. And also, say you're a landlord in Logan Square and you undertake to sign a multi-year lease that uh, limits the annual escalations in rent. So that's different from other kinds of leases. We can take that into account in our modeling if we know that it exists. Um, so for helping to preserve the stock of affordable housing, which is so important because creating a new unit of housing costs about $300,000. And that means you need about an average household income of $100,000 to afford that. Most people are not in that position in Cook County. So we really need to make sure we're assessing that stock of existing housing correctly and giving incentives for people to take care of it and preserve it. And we think through good data um, and transparent modeling and predictable um, assessments that that can facilitate investments in just that kind of stock. Uh, Rob, you, you had that other, again, I was long in my answer, but uh, the time series question. So right now, the, the modeling framework is that you start with a sample of sales, and we see the sale price, and we see the characteristics of the property. One of the characteristics is the sale date. So what we do is we create sort of a family of models that change the way we treat uh, time. Do we enter it linearly? Do we have fixed effects for seasonality? Uh, do we have fixed effects for year and seasonality? That sort of thing. And then uh, the models, so that, then you have a couple of functional forms that sort of incorporate time just linearly or fixed effects, that sort of thing. And then we um, have th right now three different estimation procedures we can use. Right? Good old OLS, right? Always there. Works pretty well. We also use quantile regression, which for those of you who don't know, it estimates the median, not the mean, of, uh, of each sub, uh, of each um, subunit of your data, right? And then we use gradient boosting measure, which is a mach I don't want to use the word machine learning, but it's it's a non-parametric estimation technique. There you go. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, you end up with t sort of like 10, 15 different models that treat time slightly differently, and then you pick the one that works the best. There are other approaches that are like completely different. Uh, we'll be exploring those in the coming years. Please give it up for our presenters. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you.